Hi, I'm Frank O'Brien, and welcome to the InfoAge Spaceflight Lecture Series. First and foremost, it's great that after a year of precautions, we're finally getting close to some sort of normalcy. Today's talk has a bit of an ominous theme to it. Uh, yes, the end of the world as we know it. Now, the apocalypse has been predicted by limitless number of people from religious fundamentalists who tell us that civil to those that are telling us that civilization will be overrun by zombies. Well, in our science-based world, we know of one threat that is very real. And many smart people are talking openly about it. What would happen if a massive asteroid was heading towards the Earth? Now, tons of debris entered the Earth's atmosphere all the time, from sand grain sized particles that we see in the frequent meteor showers, uh, to a massive rock that can render a large part of the continent uninhabitable for decades. Fortunately, objects this large hit the Earth only once every tens to hundreds of thousands of years, but the effects on humanity would be so great it would be irresponsible to ignore the threat. This is going to be an interesting talk. We're going to start with the how and the why the threat exists, and then go through an actual scenario that has been used by planners as an exercise, and we'll see what they came up with. Now, just a few words about me that you might have heard before. Many of you already know this, but for 25 years, I've been one of the editors of the NASA website that extensively documents the Apollo moon landings. And about a decade ago, I was accepted as a NASA Solar System Ambassador. There's about a thousand of us all across the U.S., and we go into communities to share insights on the NASA mission. I've talked at schools and service groups and libraries, museums, and well, just about everywhere. We're often the first opportunity for those in the community to interact with someone that has direct connections to NASA. This is a fantastic all-volunteer program. No tax dollars are spent on it, and of course, we never accept any kind of compensation. So. At the beginning of the universe, we had the Big Bang. And with it, the very first stars were born. The early universe was really nothing but hydrogen and helium and a few other small amounts of elements, which coalesced into the earliest stars. These were huge, short-lived beasts who went supernova in only a few short million years. In those stellar cataclysms, the remnants of the stars combined with the surrounding hydrogen and helium all over again, and the process repeated itself over and over for countless cycles. In that process, all the elements of the periodic table were created. As later star fo stars formed, they not only drew from the basic nuclear fuel that powers them, but also a disk of dust and gas, which went on to create the planets around each star. Eventually, a wide variety of planets form, from rocky planets like the Earth to those that are gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn. But the task of making planets never uses up all the material in the planetary disk. Fragments ranging from, again, the sides of grains of sand to those that are several kilometers across um, don't have sufficient gravity to attract the remaining material into a singular planet. The leftover matter is just left to orbit the sun with really no more hope of building a planet-sized object. With all this raw material left over and unable to form what we would call a full-sized planet, it's easy to imagine that this rubble would just harmlessly orbit the sun. Importantly, the orbits of the planets hadn't settled down into the nice patterns that we see today. One of these 
was that a Mars-sized object smacked into the Earth about 3.8 billion years ago and created the moon. Needless to say, this was cataclysmic and could very well have resulted in the complete destruction of the primal Earth. Collisions like this occurred throughout the solar system for millions and millions of years, and in some ways they continue even today. During this early era of the solar system, rubble and fragments left over from the early planetary formation period constantly pummeled the early planets. During this early and violent past, the constant bombardment essentially left their surfaces just liquid with lava. As the rate of impacts uh, lessened, the planets cooled down leaving a more solid surface that would retain the scars of the more recent impacts. The moon, being smaller than the Earth and the inner planets, cooled relatively rapidly, and the impact record is preserved from a more distant past. Now, why isn't the Earth's surface as beat up and pot-marked as the moon? Well, there's two key reasons. First, the tectonic plates of the Earth are constantly creating and destroying continents and generally erasing evidence of previous surface impacts. Next, a thick atmosphere and its resulting weather can relentlessly erode the surface of the planet. A particular example is the two mountain ranges in the continental United States. The Appalachians turn out to be very, very old, having originated nearly half a billion years ago. As time and weather took its toll, much of the mountains have become rounded and eroded, and average only about 3,3500 3, feet in height. The Rockies, on the other hand, are a relatively new addition to North America, having been created only, only about 55 to 80 million years ago. And because of this, they haven't had the uh, time to allow weathering to wear them back down. So, we have little expectation to see the scars of impacts that occurred hundreds of millions of years ago. Now, even though erosion and plate tectonics have done their best to erase evidence of ancient impacts, there are many that we do find. A few are so large that we can see them from space. Importantly, an impact releases unimaginable amounts of energy, and the large ones are the equivalent of easily millions of thermonuclear weapons. This creates very distinct and unique rock types that if they're left undisturbed, they can be analyzed even today. We find craters that are easily over a hundred kilometers wide, and many of them are very, very old. Dozens of large craters dating back a hundred to five hundred million years ago uh, we, uh, exist, and there are a few that are even a billion years old, and all of these are just now being studied. And there's a few impact sites that are only very recently being discovered. Off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, a huge 180 kilometer wide crater was discovered in 1990. Researchers found that it hit 66 million years ago, and uniquely, it deposited a layer of iridium metal over most of the Earth. This event corresponds exactly with the greatest mass extinction event on the planet, and it's what doomed the dinosaurs. But if Mexico and 66 million years ago are too far away in space and time, what about that huge crater in the Chesapeake Bay? Right under the huge bridge that crosses the bay, there is a crater. Less than 40 years ago, researchers found indications of a huge impact around Atlantic City, and within a decade traced those clues back to one of the largest impacts in North America. Uh, this occurred about 35 million years ago. The crater itself was about 25 to 50 miles in diameter, and the effects were felt hundreds of miles away. 
a mega tsunami likely reached all the way to the Blue Ridge Mountains, and it certainly would have swamped the coast of New Jersey. While the Chesapeake Bay Crater lays underwater and is millions of years old, that doesn't put the asteroid impacts out of sight and mind. Near Winslow, Arizona, is probably the most dramatic impact site, simply called Meteor Crater. This dramatic crater is nearly a mile wide and 500 feet deep. A nickel iron meteorite, only, only about 50 meters, 150 feet in diameter, hit the Earth only about 50,000 years ago and released as much energy as a 10 megaton bomb. Because the meteor crater impact is so recent and located in a very arid region of the country, little in the way of natural erosion has altered its appearance. Now let's keep this image of this impact in our mind as we continue our talk. And remember, it was only about 50 meters, 150 feet across. This is a sobering concept and give us an idea about how much energy is contained in a single object moving very, very fast. Now it's easy to think of impacts from asteroids as rare, perhaps once in a lifetime event. In reality, thousands of tons of material hit the Earth each year, and some estimates put that amount at about 50,000 tons every year. But really, that's just an educated guess. Now, most of this dust is uh, most of this is dust the size of a grain of sand, and these burn up dozens of miles in the atmosphere. On a clear, dark night, it's common to see a few of these shooting stars in the sky. About once a month, passing debris from old comets create meteor, meteor showers where you might be able to see a meteor every minute. A few of these meteors reach the ground and are recovered by collectors. And yes, there's even a small industry for buying and selling meteorites. Of course, these are usually from small pieces of asteroids that reach, reach the ground and don't really cause much damage. But there's a number of far larger pieces that reach the Earth and releases huge amounts of energy. Now, with all the terms like asteroid, meteor, and meteorite, we get to add bolides. A bolide is a meteor which enters the atmosphere and explodes before it reaches the surface. In the map here, we have the location of about 550 large bodies that reached the Earth and exploded in the atmosphere over 20 years. Each one of them released the equivalent of several tons to kilotons of TNT. Yeah, some of the bolides that reached Earth were as powerful as a small nuclear bomb. But you'll notice all of them are, seem to be evenly spaced across the, uh, across the Earth. Normally, you would expect observations to be where people can observe them, and certainly not uniformly observed over the oceans. So how can this be? It turns out these air bursts were detected by the network of satellites looking for nuclear missile launches. Now the number of asteroids is vast. We know of about 600,000 of them safely orbiting in the main belt of asteroids between Earth and Mars. But according to NASA, there's about 20,000 asteroids larger than 100 meters. That's about twice the size of the one that landed in Meteor Crater. And about 4,700 of them come close to the Earth. This video gives you the impression of just the amazing number of objects that are out there. Now, you can see that the majority of them are between the Earth and Mars, but countless others come past the orbit of Earth. What isn't seen is the estimated several million of far, far smaller asteroids, and most of these are completely undetected. This is a threat that is real. Now, let's focus on time frames. 
It's easy to imagine events that happened millions and millions of years ago as something that's unlikely to happen now or in the near future, and that might be reasonable. But here we see that there are a number of asteroids that hit, actually hit the Earth, and this is recorded for only one day in June. Most others miss the Earth by several million miles, but more than a few pass in that very small distance between the Earth and the Moon. In astronomical scales, that's a near miss. It does make the point that we're always being bombarded by rocks from space. In recent decades, lots of sky surveys have been started looking for near-Earth objects, or NEOs as we call them. In 2005, the United States Congress mandated that NASA find at least 90% of asteroids larger than 140 meters or about 450 feet in diameter. If an asteroid that large were to hit the Earth, the damage would be catastrophic, killing millions of people and if, with its effects felt over thousands of miles. From this requirement, several projects are now actively searching the skies for these devastating asteroids. This is an incredibly tough problem to solve. Asteroids that can cause devastating damage are quite small in an astronomical sense and are very, very, very dark. That piece of charcoal that you put in your backyard grill is actually far, far lighter than the objects we're searching for. Despite this difficulty, thousands are discovered every year from multiple, uh, multiple survey programs. Here we have a picture of the Pan Stars Observatory in Hawaii, which is the original near Earth object survey pro uh, 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 telescope. Most of its time is dedicated to finding these near Earth objects and analyzing their orbits to determine if they might be a hazard to Earth. A second telescope, identical to the first, was completed just a few years later. There's a second project called the Catalina Sky Survey and is located near Tucson, Arizona, and this complements Pan Stars and has a similar mission. These two photo uh, projects photograph the entire sky every few days, looking for objects moving across the camera's field of view. And this has been quite successful. The vast majority of the 3,000 objects discovered each year are the result of these two projects. A space-based observatory called NEOWISE is the repurposed uh, uh, satellite called WISE, which ended its primary mission in 2010. NEOWISE was activated in 2013 with the goal of finding near-Earth objects using the sensors that were part of WISE's original mission. The spacecraft is nearing the end of its life, but NASA has authorized its replacement, called NEO Surveyor, and will launch in 2026. Even with these specialized resources looking for hazards, NASA estimates that only about 40% of the potentially hazardous asteroids have been found. Frankly, it's quite likely that a small asteroid, too small to be detectable by these telescopes, will hit the Earth. So a final sentry system called ATLAS scans the nearby region around the Earth looking for objects that could hit the planet on a very short time scale. Its name comes from the acronym, the Asteroid Terrestrial Impact Last Alert System. And the final parts of its name explain its function. Its objective is only to provide the last alert, a warning perhaps days or hopefully weeks in advance of the impact. This notification gives far too little time to prevent the asteroid from hitting the Earth, but might be sufficient to perform evacuations or other preparatory work in advance. We have been fortunate that none of the asteroids that have struck Earth have been catastrophic, as recent ones have been uh, relatively small. Even the Chelyabinsk uh, meteor, which struck Russia in 2013, was a relatively small body, only about 20 meters across, and 
weighing only 12 to 14,000 tons. Still, it re released as much energy as a four to 500 kiloton thermonuclear warhead. Despite exploding about 30 kilometers, about 18 miles above the ground, it created widespread damage and well over a thousand people were injured. The meteor itself was a complete surprise. Because of its small size and its path, which was from the general direction of the sun, it simply wasn't possible to observe it before it reached the Earth. The event did create unique opportunities for scientists. The dust plume from its path through the atmosphere was followed extensively by satellites, and weather modeling software was be able to predict its path um, days in advance. Video, seismic, and infrasound stations recorded the event and were able to re refine the energy release and the region of space it came from. And this was done in fairly accurate detail. With this information, scientists were able to locate large samples of the meteor, which added greatly to our understanding of the event. The asteroid Bennu, which was visited and sampled by the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft earlier this year, is a large body over 500 meters in diameter. It's an example of a carbonaceous asteroid meaning that it contains large amounts of carbon and probably water in the form of hydrated minerals. We found that Bennu, due to its small size and mass, has a very, very weak gravity field. This was not surprising. But this does mean that rather than a solid, cohesive structure, it's more of a loose rubble pile that's not held together very well. When we went to retrieve a sample of the asteroid, the sampler head easily just pushed in through the surface and about half a meter down uh, before the spacecraft pushed itself away. This reveals a very interesting bit of information. As just a loosely packed rubble pile, there isn't a hard surface to push against in a, if we have any need to deflect it. Would an impactor, something to put, knock the uh, asteroid away, simply bury itself in the astronaut, uh, asteroid, or perhaps even go straight through without stopping? Another important question is whether Bennu would break up in the Earth's atmosphere, uh, causing damage over a wide area, rather than concentrating it in a single location. These are questions that we don't have the answer to, and honestly, we may never know the, uh, know the answers. A serious concern about an asteroid at impact was when scientists calculated in, 20, uh, in 2004 that an asteroid called Apoph uh, uh, Aphesis had a 2.7% chance of hitting Earth. This was, this was serious. Unlike the Chelebanks meteor, which was only about 20 meters in size, Apophis is a monster. It's 370 meters, or about a quarter of a mile across. It's large enough to devastate a region perhaps a thousand miles across and, again, potentially kill millions of people. We were able to detain this remarkable set of radar images uh, in 2012, and while they're imperfect, they're still pretty amazing. It shows that there's, it's a singular body, not a binary asteroid that scientists had speculated. Over time, we've learned a lot about Apophis and his potential paths for uh, impacting the Earth. Oh, spoiler alert, it's not going to hit the Earth for another 100 years or so, and probably longer. And that's the good news. But it wasn't always so clear. Early estimates of its orbit placed it close to the Earth in 2029, which would bend the path of Apophis to an unlikely but possible impact if, with the Earth a few decades later. After a few years of study and refining the calculations, we learned that Apophis will miss the Earth by millions of miles 
uh, after the 2029 encounter. Oh my God, how could we be so wrong? The answer lies in a bit of esoteric, but a very critical concept known as a gravitational keyhole. To appreciate the extreme difficulty of predicting the path of an asteroid, we have to describe its interactions with the gravity of a planet. As a spacecraft or asteroid passes by a planet, its gravitational pull alter, alters its, both its course and its velocity. Spacecraft frequently take advantage of this when traveling to the inner or outer planets, and in these cases, we hear it referred to as a gravity assist. Using gravity assist saves a tremendous amount of fuel, and without such an assist, many planetary missions just simply wouldn't be possible. An asteroid passing by a planet, such as the Earth, also has its course and velocity altered. In the end, the asteroid enters a new orbit, making it necessary to recalculate the odds of coming back and hitting the planet in the future. Now, here's what makes this an exceptionally hard job. With any given fixed orbit of an asteroid, it's straightforward to predict whether there's going to be a collision with the planet in the near future. But a close flyby of the asteroids creates the toughest computation of them all. The amount of change in the orbit, and with it, any future probabilities of uh, planetary impact depend on exactly where the asteroid passes by the planet. In the case of Apophysis, if there was to be an impact to the Earth in 2036, it would have to pass a region of space near the Earth in 2029 that's only about a kilometer across. This region in space is that gravitational keyhole. Miss the keyhole by even a kilometer or so, and the new orbit of Aphasis will be dramatically different, so much so that it'll never impact the Earth, at least not in 2036. So now here comes our problem. The data we have on the orbit of Aphasis in 2004 wasn't especially accurate. So there's a large amount of uncertainty whether it would impact the Earth on a later date. Some of the possible estimated positions did pass through the keyhole and would put the Earth in danger in the future. Later observations refined the orbit so that now we know it'll miss the keyhole and there's no chance of an Earth impact in the near future. Still, Apostas will pass very close to the Earth on April 13th. 2029, at a distance of only about 23,000 miles. It will be visible to the naked eye in Europe, Asia, and Africa. And needless to say, being able to see a potential future doomsday rock is a little sobering. To centralize the effort in monitoring and dealing with possible impacts, NASA created the Planetary Defense Coordination Office in 2016. Its mission is to be the central clearinghouse for over, uh, asteroid orbital data and impact risk assessment. Working hand-in-hand -hand with several federal agencies, especially FEMA, and several international agencies, the Planetary Defense Office uh, conducts tabletop exercises for participants every two years. These tabletop exercises aren't simply days of intolerable PowerPoint presentations. They're real-world exercises executed in several phases where participants are presented with a problem and try to come up with a proposed solution. After each phase, Experts who are not involved with the active discussions take the recommendations and use computer models to come up with the likely outcome of their proposals. If this sounds like a clever approach, well, it is. For decades, it's been a standard technique for business school exercises for countless uh, students. It's easy to speculate that these folks who came up with these scenarios have a background in Hollywood disaster films. You find out that there's no simplistic answer. 
and each is designed to carefully demand hard choices in order to stimulate real-world practical solutions. Additionally, they force hard political and moral choices, such as when are nuclear weapons acceptable? Which should we sacrifice, Denver or Chicago? Washington, Moscow, or Beijing? A huge but very realistic dilemma uh, presented is that in every uh, uh, early in each scenario, there's huge uncertainties about even the basic facts of the problem. There have been four tabletop exercises over the past eight years, with each one getting progressively more realistic. As an example, I'd like to pick one that's really one of my favorites, if you can call it that. It has all the elements of a Hollywood thriller, but each step is based on reasoned information that reflects the practical realities for those who are monitoring potentially hazardous asteroids. Again, it's essential to understand that these are reality, fact-based assumptions and solutions. Importantly, there's no magical science fiction weapons available and silly narratives like Bruce Willis saving the day or, well, just that, silly. We're going to follow through the one scenario and see how it plays out. Here, planners were presented with a newly discovered asteroid that's in an orbit that passes through the Earth's orbit every two years. From the very, very preliminary, uh, preliminary calculations, there appears to be a bit of a risk that the asteroid might impact the Earth in eight years. Unfortunately, constant observations, so necessary to refine the path of the asteroid, can't be done. And because of that, the risk can't be assessed. However, preliminary estimates place the size of the asteroid between 100 and 300 meters across. This is a busy chart, but it does show the difficulty of trying to observe such a very small dark object. More importantly, the asteroid has to be bright enough to be seen. The green line on the chart shows the visual magnitude of the object, where the larger numbers toward the bottom of the chart are uh, quite a bit dimmer. The Hubble Space Telescope, as impressive as it is, can't see anything below a visual magnitude of about 26.5. This is impossibly dim and is comparable to the brightness of the furthest galaxies. We also have the problem about the angle between the asteroid and the sun. For long periods of time, it's going to be too close to the sun to be visible at night and thus is impossible to observe. This was actually exactly the case with the Chelybanks uh, meteor, which, you know, again, completely surprised everyone because it came from the direction of the sun. So it was never observed. The peach colored areas over time are those periods where we simply can't see the asteroid. So, after several months of observations early on, new orbital calculations were made to just get a better estimate of the impact risk. What they found didn't look very good. So, by the middle of July 2019, enough observations were available to determine that the asteroid has about a 10% chance of impacting the Earth, with an expected encounter on April 29, 2027. This is a chilling piece of information because we have never observed such a large asteroid with the potential for hitting the Earth. The nations of the world quickly meet to discuss their options. But first, we needed more data on the asteroid specifically an accurate assessment of its size and its composition. This would then drive further observations about what kind of response is necessary. Two types of reconnaissance missions were proposed. Simple flybys of the asteroid, which are relatively quick to implement but are limited in the data that they can return. And the second option, 
to rendezvous and even orbit the asteroid, which has a, a long lead times to build and launch, but returns vast amount of critical data. At the same time, plans were created to begin work on two options for deflecting the asteroid, kinetic impacts and nuclear weapons. Kinetic impactors are really just simply large masses, typically several tons, that hit the asteroid with enough force to change its velocity slightly. On the surface, that kind of sounds like a crazy idea. How can a small object, something a lot less than the size of a room in your house, move a massive body that's much larger than a football stadium? Now, while size matters, What's more important is the energy of the impactor. Here, energy is always a function of the square of its velocity. This means for a given impactor, if we double its velocity, the amount of energy it delivers goes up four times. At the velocities we're thinking about, typically 10 to 15 miles a second, the impactor can pack quite a wallop. At the same time, we don't need to change the asteroid's velocity very much, probably only a few centimeters a second. While this doesn't sound like much, if we perform the deflection several years in advance, even a small velocity change will make the asteroid miss the Earth by thousands of kilometers. Nuclear warheads are a different matter entirely. The idea is not to detonate the warhead inside the asteroid. The trajectories of the resulting rubble are just way too unpredictable. But by standing away from the asteroid, perhaps a kilometer or two, a nuclear weapon can push the asteroid in the same manner as a kinetic impact spacecraft. There's one thing to notice on this planning chart, though. All the launch and intercept dates are locked into very small windows. This is because of the immutable laws of orbital mechanics, which greatly limit all the options for the planners. More importantly, if a rocket or its impactor isn't ready at the, in time, they've lost that opportunity forever. <coughs> if the idea of deflecting an asteroid just by hitting it with a fast-moving spacecraft Seems like a little bit too much of science fiction. Well, it's really not. This November, NASA will be launching the DART mission, the Double Asteroid Redirection Test. Its mission is to fly to the asteroid Didymos, Didymos and see how effective a kinetic impactor can be. Now, Didymos itself is actually much too big for this limited test. But it turns out it carries around a companion asteroid, a moon of its own, for lack of a better phrase, called uh, Dimorphos. Didymos is huge. At 800 meters across, it would cause a global scale catastrophe if it hit the Earth. But its companion, Dimorphos, is a much more manageable size at only 160 meters. When the DART spacecraft hits Dimorphos in late September 2022, it is only expected to impart a half a millimeter per second change in its velocity. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but over a long period of time, the effect is quite pronounced. Now, before anyone starts worrying, Didymos and its companion is not an Earth-crossing asteroid, so there's no chance that this test is going to uh, cause it to impact the Earth. And this is what the result of an impactor might look like. In July 2005, the Deep Impact spacecraft slammed into the comet Temple 1. The spacecraft's mission was to see if an impactor could vaporize material in the comet so its composition to, could be determined. The spacecraft was a novel design. It carried an 800-pound block of copper, which was released from the main spacecraft shortly before it reached the comet. Then the spacecraft scooted away from the impact path, impact path 
to photograph the results. And of course, they were spectacular. We found that the comet Temple 1 is essentially light and fluffy, and far more material was thrown out than expected. This kind of information can be very useful when trying to decide on how an asteroid can be deflected. Now here we have the briefing on December 30th, 2021, and it really brings bad news. The asteroid is certain to hit the Earth and is aiming toward Denver, Colorado. A flyby reconnaissance mission has greatly improved the understanding of the asteroid, whose size is now measured at about 260 meters by 140 meters. That seemed a bit odd. Certainly the most upsetting part of the news are the estimates of the destruction. The asteroid will hit with the equivalent energy of a 150 to 500 megaton nuclear weapon. Images confirm that the odd dimensions of the asteroid are because it is a contact binary, very similar to the Kuiper Belt object Ultima Thule that was photographed by the New Horizons spacecraft in 2020, uh, 2019. This complicates the problem for kinetic impactors and the nuclear devices that might be used to deflect the asteroids. Contact binary, binaries, as you can see, seem to be loosely joined, and an impact on one part of the body could easily cause the asteroid to break into two pieces. In this case, now there's two asteroids that need to be deflected, and unfortunately, there's no time to change the existing deflection plans. Right now, all the world can do is hope that the asteroid will stay in one piece. <coughs> The area of devastation around Denver uh, from the asteroid is unimaginable. This is, what the, uh, this is what the energy of a 500 megaton impact would result in. And a direct impact damage area is about 100 miles across. Let's consider that. If an asteroid fell on Princeton, New Jersey, most of the entire state of New Jersey would be turned into a wasteland, and New York and Philadelphia would be seriously damaged. Of course, this is just the direct effects of the impact. It doesn't account for the earthquakes or forest fires or other effects that would likely result. Well, it's been a busy last few years. It's now September 3rd, 2000. 24. From the list of the possible options that were presented back in 2021, a few were dropped and a few others were added. A second flyby was just eliminated as being redundant since a much more desirable rendezvous mission was substituted. Various kinetic impact uh, plans were evaluated and one was dropped as just simply being ineffective. A few additional impactors were added to increase the probability of successfully deflecting the asteroid. And by some miracle, three impactors hit their target and the nuclear detonation option wasn't needed. But as feared, the first impactor effectively split the asteroid into the two pieces. Fortunately, the impactors hit the larger primary piece of the asteroid. And as expected, uh, the impacts occurred while the asteroid was on the opposite side of the sun, delaying an immediate assessment of the mission. Once the geometry of the Earth and the sun and the asteroid became favorable, astronaut, uh, scientists were elated that the largest piece of the asteroid was deflected successfully and was no longer a threat to Earth. But mixed emotions quickly became apparent. The smaller lobe, a smaller little chunk, which was still 60 meters in diameter, was only deflected a small amount to the east, with a huge uncertainty about what its eventual impact point was going to be. Estimates range from a possible impact in the Chicago suburbs to a relatively splash, relatively safe splash in the eastern Atlantic. Only additional observations and tracking 
could reduce this uncertainty and narrow down the precise impact point. At this point, we don't have any more options for deflections. The orbital geometries don't allow another impactor mission, and the remaining deflector, armed with a nuclear warhead, can no longer reach the fragment. Well, it's now April 2027, and the news can't get any worse. It turns out the astronaut fragment is headed for New York City with the epicenter at Central Park. With the diameter of 60 meters, the explosive equivalent of the impact is expected to be about 11 megatons. From the reconnaissance, reconnaissance missions and studying the effect of the impactors, scientists have developed estimates of the effect of the impact, but there's still a maddening range of possibilities. They are relatively confident that the asteroid will explode high in the atmosphere, perhaps as much as 16, mi uh, 16 kilometers, about 10 miles up, which should reduce the damage somewhat. But when adding up all the variables and uncertainties, the range of destruction is from 1 to 46 megatons, which is a distressingly large range. Suggestions about launching ICBMs to destroy or deflect the fragment are examined, but ICBMs simply don't have the range or the accuracy to reach the uh, asteroid in time. The only option is to perform an unprecedented evacuation of the entire New York metropolitan area in less than two weeks. On a practical level, perhaps only a few million people will be saved. And trillions of dollars of the economy will be wiped out. It's going to be, it would be truly a sad day. I apologize for ending the talk on such a down note, but this is serious science that planners have to address. And no, it's not pretty. So let's think about a more upbeat talk like the one that we have planned for next month. With all the talk about missions to Mars, there's been a legitimate concern in the scientific community that the other planets are being neglected. In particular, Venus has only been sporadically studied by spacecraft over the last several decades. This is going to change. NASA and the Europeans have now announced three missions to the cloud trait planet and they're expected to arrive in the later part of the decade. We're going to be talking about the history of exploring Venus and what scientists are hoping to learn in the next mission. Until then, I hope everyone stays safe and healthy.